the Silk Road, um, which is an online drug marketplace or marketplace. It's an online mostly free market where drugs are one of the products that are yeah. sold, probably the majority of them. And, um, you know, he was nabbed. It's the evidence against them sketchy because you're talking about a world where this is uh, all done through the onion router, which means that uh, that's an anonymizing system for right. the Internet. There's a lot of anonymization that has gone on, and it's going to be very difficult to prove who is whom and those kind of things. It may be that they can prove that he has some uh, connection, but, uh, you know, they have to prove that he is the guy and, uh, you know, all kinds of things. So they've got a, a very sort of interesting, tough case ahead of them. So we've been following along on this Silk Road case uh, quite a bit. In fact, we've been following the Silk Road before there was a case, um, before, you know, just back when it was this phenomenon. Uh, and it still is, by the way. Silk Road 2.0 uh, came out. As you know, if you've been listening to the show for a while, the Silk Road was raided uh, back in 2013 in October. So we're actually almost to uh, to a year since that happened. Ross mm. Ulbricht has been in jail for almost a year at but he doesn't point, like that. Awaiting his trial. Trial hasn't happened yet. That's expected in November. Speedy trial, remember. You're yeah. guaranteed this by the Constitution. You they're, get a speedy trial. They're getting usually, right on that, Mark. Usually takes about three years to get a jury trial to you. And that's one of the one of the many things that is broken in this country. Yeah. Um, they talk about, uh, you, you know, they talk about we have a Constitution. You don't have a Constitution if they don't follow it. The judicial system is supposed to get you a trial within... A, spe a speedy amount of time. Of course, that's another failing of the Constitution. They didn't say 60 days, 90 days, 7 days, or whatever. They you know, they didn't say anything. So now you have police, uh, law enforcement, arresting people and then building their case. That's not the way it's supposed to be. A person should be <laughs> arrested only after the case is built. All right, let's get into the update on this case, because as Ross awaits his day in court, or what will likely be several days, I would guess as Ross awaits those days in court, uh, his attorney, who is not a cheap attorney, uh, you can go and help the family pay for these attorneys by going to freeross.org. His attorney has filed a new motion in this case. Uh, as we continue here, we were going to tell you about what the latest is in the Silk Road case. Ross Ulbricht is the young man in his, what, late 20s, I think, who is accused of operating an underground drug marketplace. Among other things, you can get some fake IDs there too, but for the most part, it's uh, it's drugs. And even, they do sell some legal stuff there as well. Silk Road was taken out in October by the feds. They took the server down, uh, but it popped back up. Silk Road 2.0 came back a month later, not helmed by the same Dread Pirate Roberts, the original owner of the owner and operator of the site, called himself Dread, Dread Pirate Roberts, and they are alleging now the federal government that Ross Ulbricht is Dread Pirate Roberts. So, All of the Dread Pirate Roberts, because there was also sort up of... Up until the raid. I don't think they're alleging he's the new Dread Pirate Roberts, who is actually right. no longer with the new site. That person bailed out on the site. But the what we had heard with Silk Road at one point before the raid was is that there had been more than one Dread Pirate Roberts. That's true. There was the Forbes article, which was an, the first interview Dread Pirate Roberts ever granted, where that Dread Pirate Roberts claimed to be the second Dread Pirate Roberts, not the original one. So, so whether that was true or not is another question. We don't know if the, you know if DPR in the interview was being totally honest. Uh, how could we, we ever know? know? Well, if it that's turns the out whole point of anonymity, right? If it turns out Ross is the man, then we might get the full story someday. But I don't know that you're uh, ever going to get the full story. I don't necessarily trust what they're going to introduce in it as evidence. Yeah, that's true, and that's actually kind of the point of this motion to dismiss that has been filed. Now, remember, there was a motion to dismiss filed previously about the money involved in the case, basically saying that it's not, you know, Bitcoin wasn't money, the IRS has ruled that it's property, and so therefore money laundering laws don't apply. The well, judge and I kicked think that, that out of yeah, court. The, the judge kicked that out. Um, there's no doubt about it. But I think that this is, what's really important is, um, in that case, because I, I disagree with the judge's statement, uh, because it's, uh, what was money at the time when Dread Private Roberts was doing this? Not what it is today, because Bitcoin has gone from not money in the government size to money in the government size to not money in the government size to money in the government size. It's amazing they've done it. They they've moved around. We how are you supposed to know? There was a time when we would say on air, well, as far as the government's concerned, Bitcoin isn't money. We've said that on air because it was true three years ago mm. when the the government hadn't recognized Bitcoin at all. 
But regardless, here's the latest news from Wired.com. The Department of Justice sees its takedown of the billion-dollar Silk Road black market as a massive, victorious drug bust. Ross Ulbricht, the alleged creator of that anonymous contraband bazaar, now wants to cast this uh, case in a different light as a landmark example of the government trampling privacy rights in the digital world. In a pretrial motion filed in the case late Friday night, Ulbricht's lawyers laid out a series of arguments to dismiss all charges in the case based on Ulbricht's Fourth Amendment protections against warrantless searches of his digital property. As early as the FBI's initial discovery of servers in Iceland hosting the site on the Tor Anonymity Network, seemingly without obtaining a search warrant from a judge, Ulbricht argues that law enforcement violated his constitutional right to privacy, tainting all further evidence against him dug up in the investigation that followed. Quote, The electronically stored information and other material seized and searched has been contaminated at its source and at several later points along the way, rendering the direct and indirect product of those searches and seizures, in essence, the entire product of the investigation itself, to be inadmissible. This according to, unquote, according to the 102-page memo accompanying the motion. Quote, Thus, the Fourth Amendment and relevant statutes require suppression of the fruits of the searches and seizures and any evidence or other information derived therefrom. So basically, the claim is that by grabbing the, uh, the information from the server in the way that they did, that they botched their case from the outset. You know... I like <laughs> I, I like it when people take this tax, but from what I've seen recently, the government doesn't believe in loopholes anymore. Uh, the The judicial system, it's not interested in whether or not they followed the law. They're just interested in finding people guilty because over and over again, we've seen situations. I thought that the uh, the Bradley Manning, uh, Pri Private Manning, now Chelsea Manning, mm -hmm. um, that situation where they made the point that the commander in chief, the uh, the the most powerful military person in America, proclaimed that uh, the Private Manning was guilty, and he did. Like there's there's audio and video of him saying it, of, of Barack Obama saying this, and so therefore he tainted the jury pool, which was all of these officers that are going to be underneath um, you know, the president. So, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the highest ranking officer in America tells the other ranking officers what he believes, and therefore that taints the whole case. I thought that was incredible. This is brilliant. This is a brilliant act, and they should have to throw the case out as a result. Nope, they don't do that. And I don't think it's going to happen in this one either, even if they're right. Yeah, I also am a skeptic that uh, the judge is just going to whisk their uh, her pen and sign this one away. I mean, she, in her response to the initial motion to dismiss that we talked about before, uh, where they were arguing about the money, the judge did not seem even at all open to well, considering removing this case. These judges want to be higher-ranking judges, right? Yeah. You don't get to move up the government judicial system by ruling against the government. Mm -hmm. I mean, within the uh, the another thing that happened in the Bradley Manning situation is, is there was these weeks, this long time testifying about how uh, Private Manning was tortured inside a U.S. brig. And the evidence was there. The judge found that uh, she was tortured there and gave... Like two weeks extra time served on like a 35 year sentence. Yeah. We'll come back with more because there's more detail on what's actually happening here with Ross's uh, motion to dismiss based on basically saying that the feds blew their case by not getting a warrant to search in the first place. Of course, we're talking sort of tangentially about Bitcoin, this wonderful decentralized currency that uh, is sort of taking the world by storm. Dell Computer, Wikipedia just started taking Bitcoin, and even local businesses in a lot of different places all around the world are taking Bitcoin. And there's also underground black market users for Bitcoin. That's what the Silk Road was and still is. Uh, the Silk Road was basically a way to go and buy drugs and other interesting things without asking any government bureaucrats permission and without having to go and deal with some scummy, shifty street dealer who... Who knows what drug you're going to get? Who knows if you're going to get robbed? Uh, so on and so forth. The black market can be a pretty scary place to do business in real life. Indeed. But the Silk Road, uh, while it wasn't perfect, you know, there were still some people on there trying to scam people out of money and things like that. While it wasn't perfect, there was a rating system. 
So you could tell who the really good players were, who the really good uh, dealers were. So you couldn't be threatened with violence into doing business with uh, somebody in particular. No, no one would know who you are. And so you wouldn't know who the dealer is. Therefore, when somebody's rating went down because they scammed somebody. You're not going to do business with somebody. This isn't like the, you know, the the drug world of uh, that we were used to up until Silk Road. So Silk Road really did amazing things uh, for the black market. It created a place where people could do business with one another anonymously, but still have a uh, record. You know, still have ratings about their anonymous transactions. Right. And what that means is, is that you have an account. But that account doesn't identify you specifically. Correct. So you get an account. It's a bunch of random numbers. You know that that's your random number account, and you have the password to that account. But that account doesn't say, you know, this is Joe Smith's account. There's no random numbers involved. There's a, just there's a name on the account. All right. So then, whatever you want. You're right. So you're Mixelplick512. Uh, there you go. Fine. Um, and then, but, you know, who's to say that Mixelplick is Mixelplick? And Hopefully that's not your last name and your area code. So <laughs> you, you want to create a name that isn't connected. To you, um, you're anyway, right about that. Silk Road's done an amazing thing. They've made the the black market a safer place. People who would have been robbed and beaten and possibly killed in the black market or ripped off, given some sort of bunk product, they have had much better experiences with the Silk Road. Anyway, the heroic, alleged operator of the Silk Road, uh, Ross Ulbricht, has filed a motion. Well, in he's court. only uh, he's only heroic if he operated the well at this point road. he's heroically defending himself uh in court by well, having... he's defending himself because that's all he can do yeah uh let's not let's not tarnish the term hero here they have... he's either an innocent accused yeah. or he's a you know you can use the term hero if that's what you wish all to right, use. well if he is dread pirate roberts he's a hero for making the black market a better place you can get behind him by going to free ross.org and contributing to his uh campaign or not campaign but his uh defense fund because his family is not wealthy, and they certainly don't have access to the bitcoins that the feds allegedly seized from Ross. The, what was it, 29,000 bitcoins or something like that? It was a lot of money in bitcoins. It, yeah, no surprise there. I I think it's... I just don't think they should be taking money from people. I mean, even... How are you going to mount a defense when they take all your money? They don't care. So here's the latest. Uh, they're filing a motion basically saying the feds botched the case by not getting proper warrants to search the computers in the first place. Uh, and the way they gathered all their evidence was basically wrong, and so therefore all of the evidence should be thrown out by virtue of the fruit of the poison tree uh, doctrine. Let's continue here with a story from Wired.com. The motion that's been filed refers to 14 distinct searches and seizures of Ulbricht's computers, equipment, and online accounts. Beyond the initial tracing of his alleged servers in Iceland, investigators performed several of those surveillance operations with trap-and-trace or pen register orders that don't require the probable cause standard necessary to convince a judge to sign off on a warrant. The warrantless surveillance ops included asking Comcast for information related to Ulbricht's alleged IP address in San Francisco, and even in the cases when investigators did get a warrant before performing their searches, as in the case of a Samsung laptop believed to belong to Ulbricht, as well as his Gmail and Facebook accounts, Ulbricht's defense argues that those warrants were unconstitutional general warrants that allowed a wholesale dump of his private data, rather than allowing the search for a specific piece of information. Quote, many of the warrants constitute the general warrants abhorred by the framers, which led directly to the Fourth Amendment. The wholesale collection and study of Mr. Ulbricht's entire digital history without limitation, expressly sought in the warrants and granted, represent the very type of indiscriminate rummaging that caused the American colonists so much consternation. So what? So basically, they would get the, the king. Um, they would get from the king a uh, a warrant, or from the governor, you know. Of, but I mean, basically, in the name of the king. They would get a warrant to, this person is suspicious and stuff. We'd like to go toss their house. Their, and find uh, whatever we may. Yeah, well, we just like to look. We just need to take a look and find out whatever it is they do. And, you know, when you lived in a culture like that and you saw that there were problems with something like that, you would put in place some, uh, you know, some restraints. However, we're 200 and something years from that culture, and people don't know what the uh, – people don't think about we, – we, we live in a culture where people worship the government, where they immediately believe when a prosecutor says that somebody's guilty – they he's bo- done it. He's done it. Yeah. Now you've essentially got to prove that you didn't do it. It's sad. Man. Even a hundred years ago, you didn't have that in this country. But somehow or another, we've become a nation of sycophants and bootlickers. And I don't, I don't know where it came from. 
So the uh, sort of a real life corollary to this example, just kind of make it a little more understandable, is the idea of this general warrant versus specific. The idea behind warrants in this country, in the United States, is that they're supposed to state specifically what it is the item there or information that they are looking for. Yeah, it's supposed to be specific. And so if in the case of them raiding a home, for instance, they're looking for perhaps uh, a drug gro- drug growing equipment or something. Bloody boots or something. Yeah, right, right. So, uh, you know, they, we think there's marijuana in this house uh, or being grown in this house. So we're looking for marijuana growing equipment. If they are to come across, you know, uh, something that might be illegal that's in the process that, you know, like a, a marijuana smoking pipe or a, a bag of cocaine, maybe that wouldn't be admissible. Uh, that's probably not the best uh, example, but... If they're coming in looking for a person. What about an unregistered gun? <laughs> how, right. How about a person? They're coming in looking for a person. Well, they can't search your coffee table if they're looking for Johnny. Right. They can't search your coffee table if Johnny can't fit in the little drawer that's on your coffee table. Right. So that's one example of it. And if they're looking for Johnny and they find a bong, they might be able to confiscate the bong because it's illegal, but they shouldn't be able to charge you with having that bong. That's my understanding. I'm not a lawyer. This is not legal advice. But is that pretty much your understanding of the idea of a specific warrant versus a general warrant? They don't I'm just sure get to it's go been perverted over time. Sure. But that's the idea of it. That's what it's supposed to be about. Uh, so Ulbricht's memo isn't simply a demand to dismiss the charges against him, which include conspiracy to traffic in narcotics, money laundering, and a kingpin statute often used against mob bosses and drug cartel leaders. It's also a request for more information from prosecutors. Despite the discovery process designed to give defendants a chance to review the evidence against them, the memo says the government still hasn't revealed to Ulbricht or the public many aspects of the investigation. The most crucial of those information gaps is just how the FBI located the Silk Road servers, despite the anonymity protections provided by cryptographic software Tor. And this was the biggest question I had when I first read the uh, the full indictment against Ross was, mm-hmm. how did they discover the location of these servers? Now, there recently was news about Tor possibly having a vulnerability and allegedly then patching it recently. But maybe that was one of the things that was exploited. We don't know, and that's part of what uh, the, def- the defense attorneys want to find out. Your thoughts welcome. It's Free Talk Live. It's Free Talk Live. We're talking about the underground drug market known as the Silk Road. More specifically, the man who is alleged to have operated said drug market, or to have been the main operator. There were several people, actually, who were involved as administrators of the site. And in fact... I haven't heard anything about the other three folks that were arrested. You remember that, Mark? It was uh, Ross Ulbricht who was arrested and accused of being Dread Pirate Roberts. But then they also arrested three other people a few months later. Uh, yeah, in another I do sweep. remember those. Those people would be turning state's evidence. All right. Well, I don't know what they're uh, what they're doing or what their status is. There was one of them that was still kind of on the run. Last I heard, I don't know if they ever caught up to that guy. I don't know what the latest is on those cases, and I'd be interested in hearing. Maybe, you know, the, the Silk Road does have a forum, and anybody can go there and read it. I haven't gone in a while to uh, to get an update on you know various different things. But I'm wondering uh, if anybody out there listening to the show tonight has been keeping up to date on those other cases. What's going on with them? Uh, all we really know about is Ross's case. So that's what we're focusing on right now. Uh, he is alleged to have uh, operated the Silk Road. They're charging him with money laundering, actually conspiracy, I think, to to launder money, conspiracy to traffic in narcotics. And also there was a computer hacking charge, I believe, as well, and a kingpin-related charge. So the latest development in the case is that uh, his attorneys have filed a motion to dismiss, basically claiming the federal government, uh, the, the FBI in this case was doing the investigation, that the FBI got general warrants when they did get warrants. They say that in some of the searches, they have 14 separate searches that they identify in this uh, motion to dismiss. Say They say that some of the searches didn't have a warrant and they should have. And they say that other searches that did have a warrant, they were general warrants, meaning that they could just dump all the data and just pour pour over it rather than having to specifically look for certain things like they are supposed to in the United States. Warrants are supposed to specify what it is that's being searched right, for. Right. A general warrant would be unconstitutional. 
So that's their argument here, and uh, we're going to continue with the latest on this. So back to the story here, the latest on the Silk Road motion to dismiss. You're welcome to share your thoughts on Silk Road, the black market, or whatever happens to be on your mind, the Ross Ulbricht case, etc. It's not simply a demand to dismiss the charges against him, uh, which include the you know, money laundering, trafficking in narcotics, etc. It's also a request for more information. The thing about the, uh, the case is they don't know how the FBI found the Silk Road servers in the first place. Tor, this an anonymous, anonymizing software, claims that they're, you know, they're able to protect people from their locations being discovered. So how was it? What was the exact method that the FBI used? Obviously, they didn't want to put that information in the indictment because whatever it was could reveal that there was uh, some sort of uh, problem with Tor, uh, maybe a back door that's been uh, put into Tor. I don't know. I don't know how they found it. But that's something that they're going to have to reveal. Eventually. This is a, I mean, you know, the, in this country, you have the right to face your accusers. You're right to have a right to the, um, you understand how the evidence was collected. You have a right to these things. All, according to the memo, quote, and this was a hundred plus page memo filed with the court by Ross's attorneys, quote, all of the searches and seizures are predicated upon the government's infiltration of the alleged Silk Road servers. However, that event, location, uh, location of the Silk Road servers, or that is the locating of them, is shrouded in mystery as the means and manner in which that discovery was accomplished has not been disclosed. Now, I don't know if this motion to dismiss is going to uh, sort of force the government's hand to reveal this information. The judge could probably cover for them, as I've seen judges do in court, by saying, we'll just address that at trial. You bring it. The, the judge could say something like, you, you bring up a good point here, but the appropriate point for this is or the appropriate time for this will be at trial. Mm. So it keep, could be years just to keep out. dragging this along. Uh, but going on here, it's shrouded in mystery and hasn't been disclosed how they found the servers. Unquote. If that initial initial pinpointing and penetration of Ulbricht's alleged servers, whether by the FBI, the NSA, or investigators with the means of defeating Tor's privacy safeguards, is determined to be unconstitutional, the defense argues that it could contaminate virtually all of the prosecution's other evidence. It points to what is, uh, it calls the fruit of a poisonous tree doctrine, stating that an improper search can invalidate all subsequent searches based on evidence found in the initial step. Sure. This is why police need to be careful when they do things. But usually the cops, in a lot of cases, I won't say usually, but in a lot of cases, the cops cut corners. And That's because the far fewer than 1% of cases in um, arrests end up going to court. Trial. So they yes. don't actually have to. Is all they have yep. to do is pile up charges and pile up uh, whatever evidence they can find. Exactly. And they don't have to show that this stuff is legal. Which is why when you get charged with something, whether it's something as simple as a speeding ticket or you know distributing marijuana or whatever it is we're talking about here, whenever you're charged with something that doesn't involve a victim, if you take it to trial, you get to see their evidence. They you file for a discovery, file a request for discovery before you go to trial and the state will send you their evidence against you. And then you can look at the law and compare the evidence to the law and find out, oh, w w wait a minute. They didn't follow their own rules. So, you know, case dismissed, basically. Or you have a better chance of winning, certainly if you know that they botched up and they, you know, cut corners. But you never find that out if you take the plea deal. You never get to see the evidence if you just cop the plea right out the gate. You can still take a plea later if you want. You can actually get the discovery, look at their discovery and determine, crap, they've got me, you know, dead to rights here. And then they might even come back with a second plea deal because you didn't take the first one. They might come back with well, a second better plea deal. And that's an important thing to point out here when talking about pleas is is that, you know, when negotiating, you don't take the first offer. And a, and a plea is negotiations. Now, these people are probably better negotiators than you are. But, hey, look, you don't take the first offer. You've got months, months. Yeah. In this case, it's been almost a year for uh, for Ulbricht. And so, you know, don't just don't just fall for any old thing. The, uh, the, the motion notes that the request to judges for warrants and other steps of the Fed's investigations didn't explain or even mention the initial discovery of the Silk Road's computers in Iceland. The memo backs up its argument by referring to several recent Fourth Amendment decisions, most notably the case of Riley versus California, in which the Supreme Court ruled that police can't search an arrested suspect's phone without a warrant due, the, due to the massive amount of private data that sort of digital device contains. It also points to another case in which Microsoft was ordered to respond to a search warrant for emails belonging to one of its users, even though the emails were stored on a foreign server. 
Ulbricht's defense refers to that second case as a demonstration that the government ought to seek a warrant even when the information it's seeking is stored abroad, as in the case of the Silk Road's Icelandic servers. Quote, the government has not provided any reason why it could not have pursued and why it was not obligated under its own theory of the scope of the law to pursue the same avenue, a warrant, for obtaining the information on the Silk Road server. Unquote. Aside from its Fourth Amendment arguments, the memo makes an unrelated request that the prosecution stop calling Ulbricht a murderer. In its criminal complaint and pretrial arguments, the prosecution has referred repeatedly to Ulbricht's alleged attempts to pay for the murder of six people, including what the prosecutors describe as a potential informant against him and blackmailer. But despite the fact that Ulbricht still faces a separate murder-for-hire case in Maryland, he hasn't been charged with any such killings in the current Southern District of New York case. The defense argues that the that the defense argues that means the prosecution's murder references are unduly prejudicial. There's some sort of something wrong with that. No, that sounds right. Oh, the defense argues that means the prosecution's murder references are unduly prejudicial and violate Ulbricht's right to a fair trial. The murder charges have weighed heavily on Ulbricht's reputation, draining support for a young defendant who might otherwise have been a cause célèbre for privacy and personal freedoms. After all, the Silk Road creator, who called himself the Dread Pirate Roberts, preached a libertarian philosophy of victimless crime and civil disobedience. With his latest motion, the alleged pirate is taking another well-timed shot at elevating his case beyond one of a cybercriminal drug kingpin, this time to a story of illegal government surveillance. And of course, the entire 102-page memo is linked here I'll link this on our Facebook, Google Plus, and Twitter so you can browse at your leisure. Free Talk Live, seven nights a week from 7 to 10 Eastern, live on the Liberty Radio Network at lrn.fm. 